The current economic crisis has put banking and the financial system in the spotlight. The generalized bailouts of financial institutions in distress have required huge transfers from taxpayers to financial institutions. According to Barcelona GSC affiliated professor Xavier Freixas, these transfers constitute an unprecedented defiance of the logic of redistribution. Can recent changes in banking regulation lead to a more efficient banking and financial industry? Never so few owe so much to so many. Let me explain what I mean by that. The crisis has been an eye-opener to political powers all over the world. When I first heard President Barack Obama state that never again will the American taxpayer be held hostage by a bank that is too big to fail, I thought we were on the right track. If we are consistent with this idea, being rigorous is planning for the crisis. So we have to define the mechanism that will be in place to limit costs to taxpayers, whether we face the crisis of a systemically important financial institution that is too big to fail, or a systemic crisis as we have recently had. Let me quote Hannibal Lecter, quoting Marcus Aurelius. Of each particular thing, ask, what is it in itself? What is its nature? So let's consider what is the root of the problem. We want banking regulation because the bank's bankruptcies have huge social costs. This is the case because bank depositors are their clients and don't view their deposits as a speculative investment. The cost of a bank's bankruptcy is also important as it may impair the well-functioning of the payment system, which means that some households and firms are then suddenly unable to enter into a commercial transaction. In order to reduce the cost of a crisis to taxpayers, what is required is a consistent bankruptcy and bailout procedure that minimizes the cost to taxpayers, has legal certainty, and is known in advance to the investors that hold the claims issued by financial institutions. This means that the bankruptcy code for banks has to be different and that it has to contain special clauses to cope with systemically important institutions and with systemic crises. It also has to cope with the issue of cross-country bankruptcy that means harmonizing the bankruptcy codes all over the world. The Basel III proposal avoids the issue of banks' bankruptcy and this is a huge mistake. To understand this, we should turn to the procedures for banks' bailout in the recent crisis. What happened, say, in Northern Rock is that while the Bank of England was quite concerned about the situation, Northern Rock shareholders preferred to wait for a better solution and go to court if necessary. In the end, the government will bail out all the bank's claim holders. And while it is important to bail out depositors, it is absurd to bail out equity holders that are responsible for the bad management or subordinated debt holders that obtained a high remuneration for their risk they were bearing, but in the end, they were bearing no risk at all. If we want to decrease the amount of taxpayers' monies that has to go to the banking system in case of a crisis, the government and central bank bargaining position has to be improved and for that the only way is to define clear-cut rules for the resolution of banks in distress. If the negotiation process between the government and the shareholders is not successful, then bankruptcy rules have to be applied immediately and the bank has to be automatically nationalized for a short period, what we call a bridge bank operation, or it should be split into good bank and bad bank with all equity holders and long-term bond holders having their claims in the bad bank. Never before have so few owe so much to so many as was the case after the recent global economic crisis. Basel III is a good start, but we still have a lot of work to do in order to avoid the same kind of devastating consequences for taxpayers when the future crisis strikes.